Uh, Jay Siegel will speak for about 10 minutes. He's got uh, a prepared set of uh, remarks. And then after that, we'll have a open discussion in which each participant will uh, introduce themselves, uh, you know, and in, in how, how many words they like, uh, and then briefly uh, uh, present something. They can also respond to any of Jay's um, remarks. Um, and then the discussion can evolve. We can respond to each other's remarks. Uh, at a certain point, I will open the discussion to people on the floor. Um, and hopefully, we will have a very good session. We have uh, a panel of four very leading minds in the field of the demography of aging. Um, but first, let me introduce Jay Siegel. He's semi-retired. Um, he was formerly uh, the senior demographic statistician at the Census Bureau and a professional lecturer in demography at Georgetown University. Um, Uh, the next thing I can't read. Um, he's particularly interested in the demography and epidemiology of human health and aging and has written a monograph on that. What I can say is that Jay has for many years been the demographer most committed to maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And he's also um, a co-author of a really classic text and reference book on demographic methods. He's responsible, among other things, for the chapters on life table construction which included a long exposition of actuarial graduation techniques. I remember Sprague's multipliers, osculatory interpolation, Beer's multipliers, and all that good stuff. And many cohorts of demographers were trained on different editions of this book, which existed over a 30-year period multiple decades. I still have a copy of one of the more recent editions in my office. Jay's had a long-term interest in the demography of aging over multiple decades, and he can best represent himself. Please. Oh, uh, so I'm going to be a sort of agent, uh, par, agent provocateur and say some, some unhappy things about, uh, about the subject of the progress we're making in, in mortality now. In fact, the, the notes that I have, possibly in preparation for a paper, is called If Heaven Can Wait, Earth's miseries are not far behind. You can draw the inference from that, but it may come from what I say. So, several years ago, I, ad I addressed the uh, SOA living to 100 um, uh, meeting, and I, at that time, I was talking about the two divergent views about human longevity, which we'll call the Hayflick Olshansky view and the uh, open Vopel view. 
one said that life expectancy is 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 subject to the strong biological evolutionary forces that uh, that and 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 the other was and and and, and concluded that life expectancy uh, it was be it would be in the long run about 85. The other was the in the Ropel uh, view a, a, a used the mathematical determinism view as I called it and argued and they still do that by 19, 2060 we would have a life expectancy of 100 and therefore they say people born today are likely to live to 100. So what I'm going to say challenges that second view completely. In fact, I think it ought to go to the dust heap of history in our field. Uh, the evidence to, at that time, I'm sorry, I took a position of an intermediate between the two because I thought that both views had cogent arguments and I just took what the view of mathematical expectation and took the mean and said life expectation will rise to about 91. Today I'm revising that view and saying I wholly I go along with the evolutionary biological view and, uh, and say that life expectation will is sort of zeroing, zeroing in on the age 85. So you know, I'm talking primarily, of course, by the, about the United States, and most of my remarks will apply, of course, to people 85 and over. But the evidence seems to be that for the industrial countries of Europe, that these statements are largely also true. The evidence for the biological view, I'm not going to go through, even though I'm saying I agree with it. If you'll please look at the, uh, <coughs> the uh, a paper by Olshansky and Carnes in the Journal of Gerontology, the biological uh, edition, you will see an article there that talks about the uh, the uh, uh, why the biological view makes sense and they give a series of arguments about it. But for my part, I'm just simply going to say that in the United States and in Europe, you have heard at this meeting already statements which agree with what I'm going to say again, that, that the major endogenous diseases are leveling off or stagnating or increasing. They are not declining. And this has gone on now for the leveling off, say, 10 years since maybe 2005. We're talking about heart cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and of course, all Alzheimer's disease, the four main causes that, that we think of as kind of all having a common basis in, in the way they, they, they come from aging cells. Now to have a, a life expectancy remember that's a mean of 100, you would need to have more about half of the population living to 106. Life expectancy would have to increase by about eight years. And uh, yet we know that at this point, again, life expectancy at age 100 has been cause sort of rather uh, stagnant, sort of dangling around a couple of years, uh, over many years. 
Now, uh, there's contrary evidence to all of these things, and you have to simply weight them. For example, I believe that at life expectancy at 105 in relation to ex uh, expectancy at 100 has gone up some, which contradicts what I knew some years back. I haven't, I'm simply admitting a con this contradictory evidence. Uh, so, when I, I mentioned four major diseases, but it's not limited to that. Of course, it includes Parkinson's disease and, and uh, uh, which, uh, uh, construct, what I call it, uh, uh, COPD. I, I, I'll give you the, the uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So let me go on then. We're going to begin with these premises. Humans are not immortal and they have a limited lifespan. And then that includes the reproductive period, the grandparenting period, maybe, and what we call manufactured time. And we seem already, oh, well. Uh, the next premise is, if you understand the way the life table works, fewer years of life are lived by reductions in death rates at the older ages than at the younger. So uh, it's not possible to reduce a death rates much, young, uh, much more at the youngest stages because they've already become so low. And if we accept our premise on the limits to life, life expectancy, we would have to reduce age-specific death rates by 95% to get a life expectancy of 100. So <coughs> uh, we don't have in reasonable terms, much area to go with even the endogenous illnesses. Now, there are numerous lifestyle and environmental factors that support the notion of, uh, of uh, it uh, contributes to this notion that that life expectancy is sort of coming to an asymptote of 85 with, of course, a distribution so somebody can live to 100. So this conference makes sense. And who are they? Well, they're part of the distribution. This is just a mean. And so, so I'm going to name just a few of these social political factors so you'll get the idea. It's a long list, but I'm going to name a few that you may not have directly thought of. I think there's increasing radiation in our environment, both ambient and, and, and instrumental radiation. Think of more frequent flying in airplanes, more x-rays that they're directed to take for for uh, diagnostic purposes. Another one that I, I'll read is regularly eating processed foods or in restaurants. The expansion of the home delivery meals business, while convenient, is not a helpful sign for human health. Now, uh, well, I, I won't expand that. So you know that we sort of, by these terms, ate some pretty bad food at this place in the last few days, and some goody good, depending on your choices. All right, now I'm cognizant of all the many, uh, maybe with my very brief uh, time left, I'll have barely a minute, I'm, I'll just say this. I'm quite aware of all the medical developments that are going on that have sort of 
been telling us there's going to be a new great day coming when we can really live for many more years. You know what I'm talking about, gene editing, electroceutical devices, a wonder drug that, uh, like metamorphin or something of that sort. Uh, and yet, well, let me see, I'll name a few more. Proton therapy in, in cancer uh, treatment. Uh, uh, okay. uh, neuro nanotechnology, organ regeneration, and so forth. Now let me let me just say this. At least a decade has gone by when all of this was known and 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 being researched, and we ain't seen no, nothing yet that. In, in, in any, in any po population sense. Of course, there's small samples of people who have made some progress through these various treatments, but they could be by chance alone. Finally, to go to further, I'll make two statements. It's a pipe dream to believe that we can eliminate health disparities. As long as we have social class differences, differences in education, differences in occupations that subject people to different risks, we will have some disparity in health conditions and therefore in longevity. Second, it's a pipe dream to believe. What we can do with that first is to reduce some of that disparity, eliminate inequity, that part of it, for sure. Second, it's a pipe dream that you're going to eliminate cancer, what they say, conquer cancer, or Alzheimer's disease, or diabetes, or, or, or whatever. If you, if you believe that there is some near expectation that we're, that the survival curve is moving toward, then you've got to have some causes to die. There are competing risks. We have evidence of that, and that is I, I make inference, inferences from the fact that in this last decade, cardiovascular disease has stagnated while cancer may have improved a bit. They're, I think they're competing. So if one is come, come near being eliminated, you're pushing the, the, the ball and it's going to pop out elsewhere. Let me see if I have any final reports before my demise. Well, uh, I, sh I should say that we, we recognize that, 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 uh, that the prevalence of these diseases are, is actually, if we even, even if it doesn't increase in numbers, more and more people have them simply because of population growth. Uh, well, let me just conclude with this sentence. It's also here in, in biblical terms. Readers are advised to be patient, or listeners, if you like, in waiting for the, common, for the coming of the great glory day and the extreme longevity wellness messiah. Okay, I'm sorry to be the bully here, but uh, anyway, um, things are now open for each of our participants, and maybe 
we can go in order from the podium down to Nadine um, in terms of introducing yourself and any ideas that you may have to start off with. I should just mention we're going yes, to be um, hearing from Peter Vekash from yes. Hungary. So it's a great honor for me to be member of this panel and thank you very much for the invitation and I'm Peter Vekash from Corvinus University of Budapest and I am not a demographer by profession I'm an actuary and I apply mortality forecasting models to forecast the sustainability of public pension systems. And uh, I mostly deal with methodological issues and there is little I can contribute about demography that I can contribute about uh, the methodological problems and solutions and promises for the future. Also in actuarial science, of course, it, it has huge implications whether this trend of increasing longevity in the long run will continue in the future or not. And it seems that there have been uh, signs that this tendency of the reversal of the, 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 the tendency of increasing mortality rates ha has in, sorry, the tendency of increasing longevity has reversed in the recent past and in the past five years we've been observing increasing mortality rates and from a methodological point of view it's a great uh, challenge for uh, um, demographers and actuaries to incorporate these structural breaks into their usual models One more thing that I think is very important nowadays is that we cannot really ignore advances in artificial intelligence and data science when we want to gain new insights about uh, mortality. And there have been some promising methodological uh, solutions in the literature that incorporate artificial neural networks and machine learning, deep learning, etc., into classical demographic research. And this way we can actually create individual mortality paths for the future instead of aggregate data. But on the other hand, we cannot really gain deep insights from these models due to their black box nature. But I think that it's going to be very important in the coming few years to pay attention to this new field and not just to the classical demographic methodology. And there is a great, uh, there, there are great opportunities in multi-population models which have been presented at this conference and in cause of death models as well. So instead of looking at univariate time series, we can have more insight from multivariate models that incorporate several populations and several causes of death into the models. And we can also increase our insights from using data for insured populations, retirees, income groups, risk groups such as smokers, non-smokers, diabetics, etc., instead of country-specific rates. So we have to maybe 
and think outside the box. And uh, instead of the dominant approach to mortality modeling, which is to use statistical extrapolation methods of univariate time series of country-specific data, we can use methods that are other than statistical methods and not univariate solutions. And maybe don't use extrapolation so much in the future. And instead of only using historical data, we can incorporate external variables, such as knowledge from medical sciences, etc. These are only suggestions, and they don't really reply to questions. They are new questions for the future. Which kind of paradigm will work best to understand the future of uh, mortality. So thank you. Um, um, Peter contributed a paper um, to the symposium based on an analysis of mortality trends in European countries, and he finds in it a what he calls the rotation of the mortality schedule in which mortality lessens at some ages and rises at others. Um, and I wondered if you could say a couple words on that very briefly. Yes, so a rotation in the context of mortality forecasting refers to the phenomenon that we experience decreasing uh, mortality improvement rates in younger ages and at the same time we experience accelerating mortality improvements at older ages in some countries, according to the paper of Nan Lee, Ron Lee, and Patrick Gerlin. And if that is true, then it can actually result in uh, increasing longevity in the long run. If we can keep in accelerating mortality in increases in the older ages, that means that there is a chance for a longevity to increase beyond 85 years. But that's just a theoretical thing because in practice it's a highly controversial phenomenon. According to my recent paper from 2019, there is little evidence that this rotation is universal in nature. I investigated data from 28 European Union countries and the result was that we only see rotation for both genders, which is statistically significant, only in the case of seven EU member states out of 28. So according to this analysis of rotation, there's little evidence to support the hypothesis that this longevity uh, can increase beyond the life expectancy at birth of 85 years. So I tend to agree with Jay that it's not really possible to sustain this in the long run. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kirill Andreev and I'm working for United Nations for Population Division. And the job essentially to look at demographic trends, mortality, fertility, and migration, and to do some projections and advise uh, member states on uh, implications of demographic trends. So if you have any policy recommendation, it will be a chance to communicate. <coughs> I'd like to say that uh, I am kind of um, more optimistic than my colleagues, and I, I, I am going to show some slides about it. So the first slide is a distribution of life expectancy for males and females in the 2018, but for some countries in 2017. So all these data are coming from the national statistical offices, and this is the, the latest data on life expectancy released. What you can see here, so this is the Japan. And life expectancy in Japan is now 87.3 years here. Yeah. Uh, it's closely followed by the life expectancy in Spain. This is 86 years. And also in other four countries, like the expectancy for females, it's more than 85 years. Yeah. So this is huge improvement over the last years. And United States, it's clearly outlined in this graph with life expectancy for females 80.2 years. Uh, for females, for males, 
the highest life expectancy now in Switzerland, about 86 miles, and it's a little bit higher than life expectancy in the uh, United States. But for many countries, it's also exceed 80 years of life expectancy in birth. For example, in Netherlands, Ireland, Spain, Israel, Italy, and so on and so forth. So if you look at the trends of life expectancy, so this is shows the trends of life expectancy in the 2000-2009 and 2010-2018. So you can see here that generally the trends of life expectancy slowed down over the next decade. Only in few countries for the males it was accelerated. In Japan, Denmark, uh, Norway, and I cannot see it. In Finland, Finland. Yeah. And for females, it's also general deceleration. In only a couple of countries, the trends in life expectancy are decelerated. But it's still above the zero. So for females, in general, life expectancy in the last 10 years was increasing point one, or it means one year per decade. And for, for males, it was increasing at point two, about two years per decade. So it was a convergence <coughs> of life expectancy between males and females. So if you <coughs> go back, you can see that it's still a lot of potential for all these countries to move to the level of Japanese females, both for males and for females. And the last slide I'd like, <coughs> I'd like to show, this is about, and this one. This is about uh, healthy life expectancy or compression of morbidity. So if you take data from Eurostat over five years, you can see that this proportion of the uh, life expectancy is uh, spent in the healthiest state. And in 2011, according to the Eurostat data and survey, it was about maybe 50% for males and maybe a little less for females. But in 2016, even over a short period of time, this point I moved up. So it means that healthy life expectancy is also increased over time. And if your life expectancy is going up with time, it means that you have more and more time you are going to spend in the healthy space. State. So this is kind of good signs for the future, you know, even if life expectancy will be increasing at a smaller pace. So this is essentially everything I'd like to say at this point. Thank you. I actually have a question for Kirill, um, who recently wrote a monograph on... Uh, global mortality trends. I'm particularly interested, if you take a global view, do we see a convergence in mortality or a divergence? And the second part of the question is, what about countries that are transitional? Uh, for example, we have the case of Chile. Um, how many countries seem to be moving out of uh, what we would call high mortality or transitional states? How many are making their way into the group that we would call low mortality countries? Just one or two, like Chile, or are there more? Uh, I'd like to say that the general trend over the last maybe 20 years was uh, convergence of life expectancies. So the countries with the lower life expectancies uh, <coughs> were reducing mortality uh, faster than uh, countries with the high life expectancy. But it also was a very kind of uh, country-specific uh, trends, and uh, there were two big mortality crises in the 90s. First, it's, uh, in Eastern Europe, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, mortality increased sharply. Another crisis was in Sub-Saharan Africa, this uh, HIV-AIDS mortality. But uh, over the last 10 years, uh, this uh, crisis is more or less kind of uh, diminished, and mortality was uh, declining in these countries uh, much faster than in high longevity countries. Yeah. 
So it, uh, in general, it was some convergence, I would say. But uh, high longevity countries over time <coughs> also made a substantial progress in life expectancy. Okay. Doesn't answer? Uh, I, I can show some plots. Yeah, for example, I can show you. This is how it looks for, for Russia, for example. So this is life expectancy before the Gorbachev campaign. It was increased during the anti-alcohol campaign, but during the transition to the free market reform, it's declined sharply, you know. And the stand, and this is very low level of life expectancy, I did it in 2005. And only from 2005, it started increasing. But this space of increase was uh, much higher than you can observe now in high longevity countries. So even the life expectancy is low in Russia, so it's increasing faster, you know. If a strength will continue, who knows? Okay? I'm done. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Um, I think it's John Murray's turn, but I think that Nadine is going to ask the question, or maybe John Murray will just speak. Uh, uh, good morning. <clears throat> I have also uh, a few remarks, and uh, uh, I just, just want to, to show you this uh, slide. I can, spoke, I can speak one hour on that, if, uh, but uh, I will try to be um, uh, very short. Uh, you have data from France, and just uh, you have all possible uh, uh, longevity indicators on that. So just uh, I want to, to focus on the low blue line. It's uh, life expectancy in France for females from uh, uh, 1816 to, to, to today. <clears throat> So you can see that during the 19th century, the life expectancy in France was stagnating at the level of 40 years. And then uh, uh, after uh, uh, 1870, so the war with uh, Germany, uh, the first, not the World War I, but the first war be between France and, and, and Germany, <coughs> life expectancy increased a lot because of the fall of, uh, of infant mortality. I want to, to, to show a, a, a second curve, which is a gray curve in the middle. So this is a, a model age at death, the most frequent age at death. And you can see that from the beginning to maybe uh, 1920, the most frequent age at death was about 72, 73 years in France with no change at all, even <coughs> if infant mortality was uh, declining since uh, 1870. There is no change in the most frequent age at death. It was around seven, 70 years. It was written in the Bible, and all the authors were saying that, that uh, uh, people should die at the age of uh, 70 years. Now I want to, to focus on the last two uh, 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 higher uh, uh, curve. <coughs> The green one is the maximum reported age at death in France since 1816. So you can see a, a lot of fluctuation. And the, the, it's behind the fluctuation, the curve seems to decrease, to stagnate, and to increase again. But it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to have a, an interpretation of, of that. If you look just below, below it's a, the blue line, maybe is the last statistical indicator we can have above the limit of the normal life if we put aside the extreme values. And the indicator we, we, we used in that, but there is many other possible uh, uh, indicators. So maybe it's uh, referring to Gerald Chomsky. Could, this could be the practical uh, uh, limit of, of, uh, of, of the uh, human long longevity. Um, it's, look, it's amazingly flat and without fluctuation from the beginning to after World War II. Most of the time, more than 50% of the time, this value was 99 years. And a few years, it was 98 or 100. 
and only one ex ex exception in 1817, it was uh, uh, 101. So it's absolutely stable. And this indicator is the last age providing at least 30 deaths in France. And the size of the French population is uh, about 30 million in 1816. So it's not a small population. And it, today it's a Oh, we have the last figure yesterday, it's exactly uh, uh, 67 uh, uh, millions. So it's, it's a sensible, sensible size. And if you look at that, you can see that um, there is no change, in fact, in the human longevity until the end of World War II. And since World War II, you can see that this indicator is showing a huge increase. It's totally linear, and uh, now it's really approaching one and and 110, so it's a 10 years increase in the age providing at least uh, uh, 30 deaths. <clears throat> that means that, in fact, something totally new occurred after World War II. Uh, uh, people, the elderly people, they are still dying. We will never prevent uh, elderly people to die, but they are dying later. And in fact, this is a, a revolution of the human longevity from, this is really the, the, the new thing. This from uh, 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 the second uh, uh, war, we are living longer and longer. And we are still, and this was obvious during these three days, we are still uh, mainly studying why we are dying. And, and what are the causes of death? We are still uh, trying to understand what we die and wh what is killing us. And we, we are doing very few uh, uh, efforts. I guess it is difficult, but it is really where we have to move, not to study mortality, but to study longevity. And here in this uh, 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 room, every three years, uh, we are together working on mortality, but also on, on longevity. And we have to understand why people are living longer and longer. We are not, it's okay, we can still uh, work on trying to understand why people are dying and what are the cause of death and the change of the time. But we are really not focusing on what is the most important if we want to understand where we are going, what is, what, where this revolution can bring us. We have to try to understand why people since World War II are living longer. So among the possible factors, we have to think about the food, the quality of the food, the quantity of the food. We may think about the quality of the water. We may think about the quality of the air. And, and uh, uh, in Europe, uh, in Geneva, the World Health Organization is talking every day ab about the huge possibility of gain if we are able to improve the quality of, of, of the air. So when we are talking about the cause of death, we are talking about individual factors. But if we start thinking in terms of longevity, what can we do to improve the longevity of the whole population? And okay, I can give you some uh, uh, ideas, but they are just ideas because there is no real research on that. The living condition from the beginning is improving. So better condition, uh, 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 at birth, better condition at school, uh, in the working life, and, and, uh, but it was never studied. It was never studied, so we don't know where we are going. Okay, I will stop here. I think it's enough. I took all my time. Thank you. Uh, we have a bit of a dilemma. We only have a little bit of time left for discussion, and I want to give you some chances to ask questions. But Jay makes the valid point. Can I say a word? Hmm? Can I say oh, Nadine? Yes, I won't be long. Okay, oh. no problem. Yeah. I will say a quick word. Hello, everyone. So I will be quick, I promise. Uh, then uh, we have to open the floor. Of course, I, I agree totally with that, and this was our plan. So what I'm about to say may be perceived as an optimistic view by most of you, but to be very honest, I dislike labels with passion, especially when it comes to this 
discussion on longevity perspectives where points of view may vary dramatically. So I believe that among humans, the mortality declined is fueled by widespread and I would say even an almost universal desire for a life that is ever longer and healthier. I don't see that this is currently changing and I don't see that this is going to change anytime soon. And so one thing that I wanted to point out was about the episodes of slowing down or reversals of mortality decline. And I think it's useful to recall that in the US, but also in many other developed countries, during the 1950s and during the 1960s, death rates slowed down. They even declined in some, some of these developed countries. And at the time, the widespread belief was, so among demographers and others, was that the rise in life expectancy had come to a halt. It couldn't, it, it had come to an end. And last night, I was even uh, talking with uh, Jay Sigur, who told me, uh, so demographers at that time, we didn't see the decline in cardiovascular disease coming. We missed it. And I, I think that we can't blame them, of course, okay? But this should teach us somehow a lesson. Let's not forget about that. So in other words, when it comes to longevity perspectives, when new mortality pattern emerges, let's be cautious. It has to persist. It has to hang, hang out before, for a certain amount of time before we can consider that this new pattern has replaced the old one. And we may think that mortality slowdowns or mortality declines that last for five years, it's an awful long amount of time, but maybe a decade is, is not even sufficient to say that we can think the old pattern has been replaced by the new one. So, so that's, that was the food for thought I wanted to share. And uh, I think now it's time to open. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Eh? Jean-Marc Fix, it's not going to be really a question, but talking about optimistic and pessimistic here. Demography and a lot of statistics are about the past. And it's pretty clear, and I agree with Jay, that if the past has not changed, we're not going to see a life expectancy at 100. First, I hate life expectancy as a measure because it's very hard to understand for the general public. Moving life expectancy one by one year has a huge impact on mortality, as Jay expressed. And I think most people don't understand that. Moving life expectancy in the 80s by 0.1 is a huge improvement in mortality there. So, so that's why with current technology, I agree, we're not moving the needle very far. There is room to move. Japan proves that it can be done. So humans can live and have a life expectancy way beyond what they are now. And in the US, we know, I mean, we see where we are. There's plenty of room to move. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's important to focus on what's new right now. And, and I appreciate Jean-Marie's uh, comment because maybe what's new is not as new as that. It's just we did not look at the proper measure. A life expectancy is quite useful in a public health setting. It might not be quite useful to understand where humans can, life can go. Uh, we have a whole new set of tools with the ability to decrypt, build genetic, build molecules from, from genes that we never had in the past. And we have to go back to the Wright brothers and see when flight was first started, it didn't look like much. It was hard to predict, you know, what it would be 50 years before, uh, later. So I think we do have promising tools, and you can see that in the progress that you see in in cancer uh, medicine. Yeah, overall cancer rates have not moved significantly, mostly because of lung cancer, but the survival rates of many cancers have decreased dramatically, children cancer for one. So there are tools that are being applied, and of course as we apply them we realize it's more complicated than we thought. But there are many tools now that have not been in the past. So 
I think, and then that's the purpose of, of a symposium like this is let's, it's important to know the historical trend, but as Nadine pointed out, it's important to know the a long-term historical trend. We tend to see a historical trend of 10 years, and that's nothing. Uh, as she pointed out, we've had many episodes of stagnation and mortality in the past in, in many countries. But understanding what possibly can come forward is also very important. And we shouldn't blind ourselves one way or the other and see what the data pops out. We have time for another question or two. Uh, Tom Edwalds, DePaul University. Um, one th thing that came out, you know, Jay, in your comments talked about you, you were focused on the United States, and um, I think it was uh, Kirill who pointed out that the U.S. was a outlier low in terms of life expectancy currently. Um, and um, I know it's come up in this conference that the United States is actually one of the countries that has the largest inequality in income and in access to health care. And I just want to, you know, if anybody has any comments about how um, life expectancy in the United States either is going to be held back uh, essentially forever by that inequality or whether that can be uh, narrowed, the inequality gap in the United States can be narrowed and, and that might improve um, life expectancies more for the U.S. points out that uh, the U.S. is a bit of an outlier. Uh, income inequality is really high and I was asking what's the potential for a reduction in the inequality and what would the effect of that be on life expectancy? Well, about the, uh, the wide gap in in, a, in income equal income, uh, I'm not an economist, so I'm not able to give you a professional response to that. Uh, but in my sense of it. If we could reduce this inequality, which I consider a serious uh, problem for the United States in particular, and really contradicts the notion that our economic status is, is very great, as the administration seems to say again and again, uh, we I believe, and, and the in income inequality, of course, has led to people not uh, getting uh, unable to buy their in the medications that, are, that they need that are of increasing cost, and and of course, and and and, and with the new with the change in the Affordable Care Act that the administration has introduced, uh, people are are. Are, are not only not getting health insurance, but it, it's, it's a possible contributor to the very stagnation that we're, that we're talking about today. So that on the, looking at it from the other side, if we could reduce this income inequality, uh, there's no question in my mind that it would help reduce the, uh, uh, the inequalities of my social class, particularly in, in mortality and morbidity. So it, it, it could be an important factor that, that I can't give any quantitative uh, answer to, but I would agree that it certainly is, is an important factor. Okay. Yeah, I want to show you some slides on the United States. It's a brief line. So if you look at the United States, on the recent trend in life expectancy, so you can see that uh, it's known that life expectancy was declining for males for the last few years and stagnated for females. 
and this is uh, mortality improvement rates. So this is the ages the death rates were increasing for males and for females. And increases uh, known for external causes of opioid crisis and also driven by non-Hispanic white population. So this is mostly kind of uh, social issues and I think it will be addressed in the future. Yeah. Uh, another problem is that for the baby boomers, the rates are also increasing here. Not as much, but it's still less, uh, how to say, less research issues for the United States. And I completely agree that a uh, huge uh, part of the lagging behind the other countries, it's, it's, it's a large inequality so in the United States. It's been some research that actually, if you look at the regional mortality by states or by counties, this is life expectancy, it's been diverging over time. You know. And unlike Canada, the life expectancy over promises was conversion in the United States has been diverging, especially in suffering states, uh, it's been a very low progress over the last maybe four decades in life speed. So if this is uh, inequality somehow addressed, so I think it's, it's, it's huge potential for the United States to increase life expectancy. Леонид Гаврилов, Norco, the University of Chicago. I have some comment to Jean-Marie Rabin presentation. This indicator for 30 people surviving to highest age, uh, they depends on the number of people who survive to age 100. So it's the more exposure, the population growth and improving survival function. What really matters is the remaining life expectancy at age 100. So that's the measure to, to introduce in the analysis. Thank you. Okay, well, we're officially out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and f for contributing to the discussion. Thank you.